Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle White, Senior Curator at the Manila Collection. So thank you all for joining us. We are delighted this evening to be partnering with our friends at InPrint to present tonight's conversation with acclaimed writer Maggie Nelson. Maggie's book, On Freedom, Four Songs of Care and Constraint, was released by Grey Wolf Press earlier this fall, and we're beyond thrilled. She's agreed to be in conversation with us. She'll be reading a selection from the book for about 10 to 15 minutes. And afterwards, she will join me for a conversation. I'm also excited to uh, have a conversation with her about our current exhibition on the work of the French American artist, Nikki Desenfall, that's currently on view at the Manil. Maggie will be able to take a few questions before our program wraps up this evening. So please, if you're live, Send in your questions as we're moving through the talk. You can send them to programs at manil.org. Um, and so now I'd like to turn it over to our partner for this program, Rich Levy, the executive director of InPrint, who will make the introduction. Thank you, Michelle. What a pleasure and an honor to introduce Maggie Nelson tonight with her new book on freedom. Four Songs of Care and Constraint. We at InPrint are delighted to collaborate with Michelle and Lauren and Tony and all of our friends at the Manil Collection on this event in connection with the Manil's wonderful Nikki de Saint-Fall exhibition. And are grateful to Maggie and the folks at Grey Wolf Press, her publisher, for making this possible. <clears throat> I'll just give a brief shameless plug for InPrint. We are a literary arts organization. Our website is inprinthouston.org. If you enjoy tonight's program, we invite you to join us this spring for live stream events featuring some of the world's great writers, including Honoré Fanon Jeffers, Tiffany Yannick, Olga Tokarczuk, live from Poland with her translator, Jennifer Croft, <clears throat> Josef Komunyaka, Carl Phillips, Hernan Diaz, Alejandra Zambra, all part of our 41st season of the Inprint Margaret Root Brown reading series, and much more for writers and readers of all ages and backgrounds, inprinthouston.org. It is very exciting to encounter a new book by Maggie Nelson, her 10th, and I am thrilled about On Freedom. In its four sections, Nelson takes on the complexities of the cultural, intellectual, visceral aspects of four distinct realms, art, sex, drugs, and climate change. For me, Mira Sharma in the Washington Post perfectly describes the experience of reading on freedom. She calls it a book that asks us to boldly and generously enter the minefield, to pick up what we find useful, to be pushed and provoked, to polish and discard and reinvent, and then to decide alone and ideally in communion where to go next. Clearly, as Sharma indicates, this is a complicated world. And for Nelson, a true and meaningful engagement with experience requires letting go of all, or at least most, preconceptions. <clears throat> as Ismail Muhammad writes in the New York Times Magazine, Nelson thrives in the intellectually murky spaces that politics wants to simplify. This willingness to linger amid an uncertainty, a willingness that made the Argonauts, her previous book, so immensely popular, is the engine that powers her new essay collection. Later in the same article, Muhammad continues, if on freedom can be boiled down to an exhortation an exercise that Nelson would surely be wary of. It would be to look, to listen, and to get comfortable with the instability you might find upon doing so. Over and over again in her work and in this book, I'm grateful for Nelson's refusal to simplify or reduce difficult matters. For example, when she writes in Art Song, the first section of On Freedom, it seems to me crucial, even ethically crucial, to treat with caution any rhetoric that purports to have all ethical goodness on its side. Well, I just want to hug her. 
This is a book that you will want to read with pencil in hand so that you can underline your many favorite passages and read them later to partners, friends, colleagues, neighbors, etc. Nelson's other works include The Argonauts, a memoir for which she received the National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism, Bluettes, an arrangement of 240 prose poems that form a meditation on the color blue, lost love, grief, and solitude, and the art of cruelty, for wit, of which, excuse me, on freedom is a kind of sequel, plus three volumes of poetry and more, which, as you might expect, resists simple description. Among her many honors, she has received a fellowship from the MacArthur Foundation in 2016, and she is currently a professor of English at University of Southern California. Please welcome a writer whom Lara Feigl in The Guardian calls one of our most radical and forward-looking thinkers, Maggie Nelson. Thank you, Rich. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Um, Good to see you. Thank you. That was such a nice introduction. I want to hug you for it as well. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's why next time, next time. <laughs> next, I virtually do so. And that was just really nice. I really appreciate it. And um, um, thank you also to Michelle, who with whom I'll talk shortly, and to anyone here. Um, I have a cold, which is not COVID, but I just want to say that I that the cold is uh, it's uh, characterized by sudden abrupt coughing fits or sneezing, and I'm, I'm so that might happen. And if it does, I just want you to know that it's okay, but you have to wait. <laughs> so okay. But I have a lot of things that I'm armed with here, to like cough drops, to, to have it not happen. And luckily, I'm not with you, so you don't have to fear me as an agent of disease. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit to start before we talk. And I'm going to read, um, like Rich said, there are four chapters in the book. And the first one is about uh, art. And it's called Art Song. Um, and I'm going to read the opening of it. And I'll see how far... I get uh, in the 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, the book is is uh, divided into these little, like, I don't know, 18th century, like, um, segments. And the first one is called The Aesthetics of Care. The Aesthetics of Care. A few years ago, I was asked to be on a panel at a museum discussing the aesthetics of care. The invitation read, quote, in a year 2016 marked by divisive political rhetoric and acts of exclusion, the question of care has newly and forcefully emerged within cultural discourse. What might an aesthetics of care look like today as a deep structure that might drive artistic practice formally and materially? How do ideas of care as a form too of love transform the aesthetics of protest? How does art survive? How can we care for it and how can it care for us, end quote. That event never got off the ground, but the invitation got me thinking. In a world in which so many do not have enough care, indeed are aggressively, often punishingly uncared for, or regularly coerced into caring for others at the expense of themselves or their loved ones, not to mention a world in which the regular triumph of something we sometimes call freedom over and opposed to something we sometimes call care, may very well end up responsible not just for much past and current suffering, but also for extinguishing planetary life as we know it. In such a world, the urge to seek and valorize care in everything, including in art, makes sense. The urge correlates to the demand, coalescing in activist circles for some time, for its politics of care, defined by Greg Gonzalez and Amy Kapinski as, quote, a new kind of politics organized around a commitment to universal provision for human needs, countervailing power for workers, people of color, and the vulnerable, and a rejection of carceral approaches to social problems, end quote. This urge also finds inspiration and echo in the work of scholars such as Christina Sharp, who along with others has imagined care as, quote, a way to feel and to feel for and with, a way to tend to the living and the dying, and linked it, specific, end quote, and linked it specifically to art making and to art viewing. Given my interest in all of the above, why I wondered was my first response to an aesthetics of care as something that would extend beyond an animating principle for certain artists, yuck. 
In pondering, I realized that while I've always taken issue with art that aims to endanger or terrorize its audience or participants, I've never gone to art looking for care, at least not in any direct fashion. In fact, I've always felt that art's not caring for me is precisely what gives me the space to care about it. Certainly I have been moved and nourished by some art motivated by care, just as I have at times felt myself motivated by it, even if I usually suspect the motivation. But I've also long valued arts not caring as a portal to forms of freedom and sustenance that differ in key ways from those engendered by politics, therapeutics, or direct service. As artist Paul Chan has it, quote, collective social power needs the language of politics, which means among other things that people need to consolidate identities, provide answers, make things happen. Whereas my art, he says, is nothing if not the dispersion of power. And so in a way, the political project and the art project are sometimes in opposition, end quote. Acknowledging and allowing for this opposition when it occurs is not the same as coordinating aesthetics off from politics. It is about attending to and allowing for differences between sensibilities, between spheres, and between types of experience and letting go of the insistence that aesthetic and political practice mirror each other or even correspond amicably. This is especially crucial when it comes to the call for care, which is a much trickier rallying cry when it comes to art than it may initially appear. This trickiness has to do with art's status as a third thing between people, whose meaning, as Jacques Rancière has it, is owned by no one, but which subsists between artist and spectator, excluding any uniform transmission, any identity of cause and effect, end quote. Whereas care can slip quickly into paternalism or control when it is not experienced as care by its receiver, think for example of the last time someone did something you didn't want or like because they quote, cared about you, end quote. Art is characterized by the indeterminacy and plurality of the encounters it generates, be they between a work of art and its maker, a work of art and its variegated audience, or a work of art in time. Its capacity to mean differently to different viewers, some of whom have not yet been born or who died long ago, will always complicate any judgment that pretends certainty about any given work's meaning or that purports that meaning to be self-evident or fixed. This indeterminacy has never kept critics or curators or panel organizers from, from participating in the age-old sport of imbuing a philosophical, political, or ethical concept with a positive valence or a negative one, think of Hitler's degenerate art, and then gathering art under its rubric. Progressive and conservative critics alike, for lack of better terms, play this game, insofar as both often embrace the premise that art has a moral function, such as showing us how to live or encouraging connection or underscoring another value, such as care, community, beauty, honor, subversion, sociality, wildness, and so on. In literary circles, philosopher Martha Nussbaum has become well known for the reading novels make us, makes us better people argument. They have to be the right novels, of course. Master of Relations, Henry James gets a thumbs up. Solipsistic Samuel Beckett, a thumbs down. Many critics have run poetry through a similar sieve, as when Juliana Spar argues in Everybody's Autonomy that, quote, when we tackle literary criticism's central question of what sort of cells literary works create, we should value works that encourage connection, end quote. But how can one sort out which works encourage connection and which works do not, when the one thing all art does, even Beckett's, is transmit a signal put forth a communication, which is by no means ontologically invalidated as a transmission if it expresses misanthropic, opaque, or antisocial elements. Such underlying moralism may be one reason why abstract theorizing about art can take a bit of an embarrassing turn when it runs into actual works of art or artists who often prefer that the field of play remain less codified or sanitized. Here, for example, is painter Amy Silman recounting a talk she attended by Franco Berardi. This is Silman. I recently heard Bifo Berardi give a talk about not working, something that doesn't make a lot of sense if you actually like working in your studio. Finally, he made a distinction between work and art. 
saying that to make art is to make something beautiful, meaningful, erotic, empathetic. And as usual, when this is the language used to describe what we're doing, I wanted to barf. We're not making sexy beasts. If anything, call it libido instead of erotics. But we want an art also animated by ugliness, destruction, hatred, struggle. Punk seems as close as one can get to describe it, but what could be less punk than staying up late in the studio, trying hard to make a better oil painting? It's so earnest, it's so caring with our smock, our tongue between our teeth, paintbrush poised, trying so hard, like the artists in a Jerry Lewis movie. What are we doing? I can still only call it looking for this fragile thing that is awkwardness. This is not alienated labor, not a commodity precisely, but a need a way of churning the world as your digestive system churns food. That's the end of the Silman long quote. Silman's wanting to barf echoes my yuck. Both are visceral, admittedly juvenile attempts to repel the critic's dogged desire to convert a corporeal, compulsive, potentially pathetic, ethically striated or agnostic activity into something beautiful, meaningful, erotic, and empathetic. Both cleave to art, I'm sorry, both cleave to art making as a metabolic activity, a way of churning the world, rather than as something in need of defending, alchemizing, or otherwise proving socially worthy. Note too that Silman's version of caring for art conjures the simple image of the artist in her studio trying to make a better oil painting. Caring for art, as far as most artists are concerned, often means finding the time, space, proficiency, and determination to make the best thing possible, whatever that means to her. For those who may disproportionately engaged in providing care for others, which still typically means women, this caring may also entail figuring out how to suspend or offload the burden of caring for others long enough to be able to stand around in your studio with your smock on, your paintbrush poised. When I write about art, I try to keep this wanting to barf in mind. I try to imagine approaches that don't moralize or nauseate, knowing that we all have our hobby horses. Openness, nuance, context, indeterminacy might be mine. I try to keep in mind the artist's body, what it feels, what it wants, what it's compelled to try, along with the knowledge that failure, aesthetic and otherwise, is an integral, inevitable part of the process. I try to keep alive Susan Sodtag's simple question, posed in Against Interpretation, what would criticism look like that would serve the work of art and not usurp its place? For this is not just a matter of how to write good criticism or how to keep criticism in its allegedly proper place, i.e. subservient to the genius art that gives it rise. It's also an ethical matter. Insofar as Sontag's question reminds us that the world does not exist to amplify or exemplify our own pre-existing tastes, values, or predilections. It simply exists we don't have to like all of it or remain mute in the face of our discontent. But there is a difference between going to art with the hope that it will reify a belief or value we already hold and feeling angry and punitive when it does not and going to art to see what it's doing, what's going on, treating it as a place to get the real and irregular news of how others around us think and feel, as Eileen Miles once put it. I'm just gonna read about four more paragraphs um, this is a new section called The Orthopedic Aesthetic. So went my thinking in a 2011 book called The Art of Cruelty. In that book, I examined the legacy of claims made by the historical avant-garde about the salutary events of representing, or more rarely reenacting cruelty, violence, and shock. I treated these claims with skepticism, but I steered decisively away from blanket statements about what representations of brutality do or do not accomplish. Instead, I argued for the importance of attending to context and the indeterminacy wrought by time, which transmutes the initial meaning and audience for works of art, not to mention one's own shifting feelings toward them. I tried to dramatize this argument via narrating my own expeditions into turbulent areas of 20th century art, hoping to model a certain openness and curiosity throughout, along with the happy freedom of knowing I could turn away whenever I saw fit a condition provided by art more than by life. As Sontag reminds us about the latter in regarding the pain of others, there is not going to be an ecology of images. No committee of guardians is coming to ration horror, 
and the horrors themselves are not going to abate. I was critical throughout of what art critic Grant Kester has called the orthopedic aesthetic, the avant-garde conviction that there is something wrong with us that requires artistic intervention to fix. Even as I recognized that this conviction animates much of the art I care about. But since having strong expectations of what other people should feel or how certain work should make them feel is not usually a recipe for their autonomy or liberation. Ranciere's formula that, quote, an art is emancipated and emancipating when it stops wanting to emancipate us, served as my enduring guide. Now, that book was published just a decade ago, but its arguments would seemingly merit an update. Now that the 20th century debates over the merits of shocking the bourgeoisie have largely been displaced by a discourse about how and when certain transgressions in art should be called out or held accountable, with the twist that the now so-called left is often cast, rightly or wrongly, in the repressive punitive position, with the right-wing morality police appearing newly, if hypocritically, selectively, even sadistically, enthralled by disinhibition, lawlessness, debauchery, and quote, freedom and fun, which is what the ex-lawyer for the neo-fascist group, the Proud Boys, said the group stands for quote, love of country, small government, freedom, and fun. Or think of self-proclaimed dangerous faggot, now ex-gay, uh, Milo Yap Yap <laughs> Yiannopoulos, who described himself as, quote, an artist who's going to create provocative, dangerous things to counter the oppressive, corporatized fucking boredom of the mainstream progressive left pride movement with the fun, mischievous, dissident magic that made the gay community so fantastic in the first place. Now this reversal may sound strange, but it is not in fact novel. The idea that artistic transgression aligns with what we might now call progressive politics or social justice is belied by the very birth of the avant-garde, marked for many by the 1909 founding and manifesto of Italian futurism, in which its author, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, introduced the concept of hygienic violence that would wreak havoc in the century to come, and famously proclaimed that his movement would quote, glorify war, the world's only hygiene, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom bringers, beautiful ideas worth dying for, and scorn for woman, end quote. Not but a decade later, Italian futurism, which pioneered the many poetic and typographical innovations now known as parole and liberta, or words and liberty, along with a host of other radical aesthetic activities that presaged performance art and punk rock, officially merged, that Italian futurism in a decade, officially merged with Mussolini's National Fascist Party. And so, at a time when bigots and thugs deploy free speech as a disingenuous, weaponized rallying cry, it makes sense that some would respond by criticizing, refusing, or vilifying the discourse of freedom and postulating care in its place. But care demands our scrutiny as well as do the consequences of placing the two terms in opposition. For beyond today's tinny stereotypes of bully and snowflake, target and troll, defender and supporter, perpetrator and victim, lie dimensions and archives of artistic freedom of critical importance for all makers and viewers. Attending to these freedoms while engaging the grave issues that have necessitated their interrogation has become our charge. And now I will stop reading and Michelle and I will get to talk. So. Thank you so much, Maggie. And thanks for joining us in Houston. First I wish I were in Houston, but. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a sort of shout out here for everyone in the audience to please send in questions to programs at manil.org. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll be pulling as we're talking to, um, they come up on my, my screen, but I just, Thank you. I, I, you know, I've been reading your book the last few days, um, and it's absolutely sweeping. And as you know, Rich mentioned how you move through drug and art and sex and environmental catastrophe is truly astounding. And I, you know, I have to say, like, I was in constant awe as I was was reading it because you also have this remarkable ability to very pull from these very you know, theoretical, if not esoteric terrains, and you, you sort of pull them down into our space as a reader. Um, 
And, and for me, that really felt like an act of care itself, like mm -hmm. how you were thinking about the reader, how you were making this accessible. Because I also then thought a lot about your process in terms of what you were just saying, that you like, you know, this like idea of art not caring what you think, this sort of resistance to not having meaning. And I think like in doing this, in your approach to writing, it, it gave me space, I think, to like kind of grapple with the sort of complexity of of your your notions of freedom. And and so I, I want to thank you for that. And it, it almost sort of mirrored your your whole sort of uh, theory and approach. And it just led me thinking as my first question, as you're sort of thinking about arts reception and audience, how in writing this book were you thinking about the audience? Who is your audience? Who are you writing for? And how like, how like, what was your strategy and like kind of promoting in the writing itself, like what Rich was calling this kind of intellectual murkiness? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for saying all that. It makes me feel like the book worked, you know, like your, your, your experience of reading it made me feel like that that's, you know, every kind of everything I was, I was trying to do. I mean, I think that, I mean, in what I just read from that chapter, I think that there's a part of that where I make clear that like, even as say in the art of cruelty, I, or, um, or not the art of cruelty, even if say like, um, even if I'm critical of like an artist who says, hey, I'm motivated because I want to change you or, you know, operate this orthopedic aesthetic on you or wake you up or, you know, I mean, look at Kafka with, you know, like the acts that hacks that are frozen scene within like, um, like, I think, you know, I can be, I can be, I can be critical of like, um, the urge while like loving the art that it produced, you know, so I think that there's a kind of, um, I think in some ways the not caring I'm talking about has in part to do with like the disassociation between artist intent and like what we hope or say about our work and then what it's actually doing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that follows for a book like this, you know? And, the, and so I, I guess part of what is to say that artists are different and that some people, you know, Kafka may be like, I need to break up the, you know, the frozen sea within people. And for me, you know, I have always just as like a person, um, been you know been really interested like when I started reading John Cage actually as a teenager and he started talking and I was and he was saying things like you know art shouldn't like you know like push people around or give them your problems or like I don't know and I, I was very interested in this kind of idea of like you know, he was very interested in making space and space making is like an act of love and so I think I, I started writing about that in the art of cruelty weirdly um, and I and that's always worked for me now on the same time and this is important about paradox. Like a lot of people would think that John Cage, as a as an avant-garde uh, composer, um, you know, people have likened him to like a Protestant preacher. Like that he had a lot of urge to do things with the work, you know. So I don't think it's ever like quite simple. But I think for myself, I don't try and think about audience. I don't try and um, I don't. I don't have in mind like convincing somebody of something as I write. Like the only way I've ever known how to, I mean, making things is hard. Like writing books is hard, making art's hard. Like the only way I've ever known how to do it, any project is by just getting really close to questions that are bothering me and talking to myself or to, uh, you know, summoned others in the solitary room of writing um, to try and work them out. And I think that that, that can't have, that, that there is no audience save like my own mind. Uh, of course it's getting, it gets weird because when you start like giving your book to people like friends or editors who are gonna help you with it in the world, you know, this question of like, who is this chapter talking to yeah. <laughs> starts to come out. And of course, when you begin imagining audiences that's when you begin imagining like, oh, who, who would love this and who would hate this and who would say this about this. And, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's very useful. So I, I still kind of try and keep it at bay. Um, I'm answering your question in a really long way. I guess the last thing I'll say is that like, um, is that I, I think that books, 
like Eileen Miles, who I just quoted, who was like important to me when I was coming up. Eileen always talked about like prognosticating an audience, like making an audience by talking in a way like in their case, they were talking about kind of putting lesbian content in places where it wasn't and kind of like summoning the lesbians, you know, like that and 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 then maybe making them a new kind of lesbian or something that could hear themselves like um, answered in uh, who to answer this call. And I think with my books, I've thought kind of something of the same, like I don't presume a kind of base level of education or non-education or esoterica or anything. I just think, well, I'll write it and the people who are interested in this, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come, they'll come to the call, you know, or they won't. And that's mm -hmm. fine either way, you know. Well, I mean, well, I mean brilliant. brilliant. Because I feel like I'm getting feedback on my mic, Ben. But uh, what, what I just, I have to say like your fluency though, like Sontag, Marks, they all sort of come in, but you are, there's a generosity to how you're writing that, even if I don't know the sort of Ranciere reference you're making, you're allowing me as a, a reader to sort of still feel connected to that, you know, academic kind of level, if you will. And I, I think it's uh, really thoughtful and Im important. And I think it does imply a certain audience of, of knowledge because, you know, my other question is like, for audience, like what, I felt like what was so disconcerting about it was I almost felt like, you know, you're talking about the liberal left or the sort of progressive side, but in many ways, isn't that your audience where, you know, you're, you're attacking these sort of like fundamentals that sort of we, we say from a sort of liberal side, I assume is how we should understand the world, how we should care about art in a particular way, but it, it very much feels to me that you are addressing a particular mm -hmm. side in the right way and a really kind of unnerving, brilliant, brilliant way. I mean, I think one thing in what you're saying that uh, makes sense to me is that, um, I mean, this came up a lot with the Argonauts where like I, You know, that book like had a lot more readers than I imagined. And like there were a lot more eyes on it, like not queer eyes kind of than like I imagined on it. And like I think that was an interesting experience because I feel like uh it wasn't a book I thought about people's eyes on it, like some of the eyes that eventually got on it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and but I'm glad that I didn't I'm glad that I didn't write it like with a different like headspace, you know, I think that in this book, like you're saying, um, you know, I think we're in this difficult moment where people are on the one hand, they're like, oh, God, we don't want like the left to be in a firing squad. And like, why can't we keep our eyes on the real enemy? And everyone knows it's the white supremacist anti-democracy forces that are, you know, they're about to overturn Roe versus Wade and take away our country. And like all that, like all that is true. Um, and yet, like, it's pretty it's pretty boring, you know, so it's very boring, like as like intellectual work, like that's political work, you know, to me like that, that's that resistance. The intellectual work, you know, seems to me like that there is a kind of a certain kind of, um, I wouldn't even call it housekeeping, but just, you know, like a kind of attentiveness to, like I say here, you know, like getting all these invitations to do these events about aesthetics of care. And, and I feel like it's like my duty in a way to think like, huh, if I'm not having the kind of, reaction I'm imagining this, you know, museum or panel organizers hoping I'm having to this invitation, like what's going on with me, you know, and I think like, and, and I'm thinking, huh, I think this valorization of care is like important on the one hand, and then um, like I know enough about its history that maybe one of my critical duties could be to lay out a kind of genealogy of like how I've seen the word working in the past, like a hundred years in art or something, you know, and that that might be useful, you know? So I think that, um, not, not more lyrical writing, but sometimes I do think of critical writing as like, like you're saying, not like a generosity, like, um, you know, like cutting out like a pound of flesh or something, but more kind of like, huh, like not everyone does all this reading or work. Like, I like it, I have, and I can kind of lay it out here um, in, a, in a cogent fashion so that people can like pick up whatever tools might be useful and then take them to for some other purpose, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's fantastic. Fantastic. it really is fantastic. And it almost feels like a rallying call too for like, you know, okay, like let's face it, I'm a art museum curator. But it's like, remember art's about ambiguity. Remember there's no answers. Remember it's about this space, like space making as an act of love that's so easy to forget when we're sort of swept into these conversations that you you bring up in your book, say the, the racial reckoning in museums, the sort of space between censorship and protest and the sort of fine line between what we're really asking for and what we need to be championing as you know leaders in the arts. Um, and, and especially for me, like I'll say like, you know, as in a position of authority in an art museum, what, what that means, what that responsibility is and kind of really, I just feel like you keep pulling back to the fundamentals of, of what art is that we can't forget. Um, so I that. Thank you. I mean, I think it's really hard because I think a lot of the conversations I've had about art in this book, like, like I think someone in your role, you know, is really different than somebody like in my role. And I think like a lot of the conversations I've had I've, um, you know, I've really felt and kind of understood the, like the privilege of kind of hanging around on, like on the outside as like an outside critic, being able to be like, oh, I see this or I see that. And it's really different when you're like, you know, when you're in these institutional spaces making all these decisions. So I think, um, but I guess like you're saying, I think that sometimes I have felt like as we do the necessary institutional critiques and like different forms of reckoning, uh, it, you know, sometimes it can be like, I don't know how to say it, but it's like, um, it's like sometimes the art part kind of gets collapsed <laughs> like and, and like fissured away until what we're really only doing is like political and institutional work, mm -hmm. which, which may for some people actually be fine and like actually might even be the name of the game in a certain way because that's a kind of art life collapse you know um and i think you see a lot of and there is actually really interesting art that can come out of that impulse um but there's other art that 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 relies as a kind of the paul chan quote on 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 acting in a different system in which case the institution it seems to me like it's uh, has a difficult path where it's trying to both um it has like uh, it has two or more very different types of activity that it's trying to balance at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, but that we should just sort of pull out from not just your chapter on art, but but how you kind of apply this throughout. And I also kept thinking about you bring up Against Interpretation and Susan Sontag. And I always like whenever I'm working with a young writer, you know, how it is what it is, not what it means is like such a like sort of rallying cry for me. and. Yeah. And it seems like that's really kind of the basis of this, because then you can take it to sort of how you're approaching drugs or sex or things that you think you have a particular understanding of or certainty about that you kind of upend by by your questions. Yeah, go ahead. No, you can. I was just going to say that, you know, I think that there's like a you know, if you teach writing like I do, you sit in a lot of workshops and I'm very alive to the fact that like, you're trying to help people make something better, but the but the phrasing is often kind of always sounds to me like there's a platonic piece of writing in mind that would be like the, the, the right piece of writing and that we're all kind of like, if it, you know, I'm not really into, you know, this, but if it were more like this, then I think it would really be impactful or whatever, like these kind of words, but you're like, mm -hmm. and I'm always like, well, you know, okay, so that is fine when you're working on the writing, but when the thing is like done and out there, then it, then it is this thing that it is, you know, and it's like, oh, I would have liked it if she'd addressed more of the situation in Libya. Well, she did, you know what I mean? She did, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was her diary from living in Morocco. So that's what, it, what that was, you know, and like, and I think that, I mean, to me, I mean, I think what you're saying about with all the chapters is that like, you know, this book's kind of closet sleeper theme throughout is about in a kind of spiritual sense of like the back and forth between like accepting what is, you know, what 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 is with all of its difficulties and flaws and suffering and then um and then how to make how to 
you know, how to work for to change the things that we don't like the way that they are while not activating kind of um, our own systems of like aggression or non-acceptance that might cause us or other people suffering, you know, well, but, but, but I'll, we'll also understand that change is possible. And, and that's just like a, I mean, again, back to John Cage, he had that piece called um, uh, like, don't try to change the world. You'll only make things worse. Like, I don't, I don't agree with, you know, I'm not like saying that per se, but I think that, I think it's a really, I've always been really interested in that tension. And I think each of these chapters has that tension in it in a different way. You know? And, you know, Maggie, this is um, imprint. with imprint here tonight. We have a lot of writers in the audience and, you know, what you said about kind of discovering that kind of sleeper theme in, in the book. I, I was just curious about your process. Like how, do you know where you're going when you start and how do you use writing maybe like because it seems to me as you're reading it you are also kind of grappling you're you're with us kind of wrap, trying to wrap your head around it and, and bringing us into the process and i i just want to know a little bit about how you kind of approach your your topic before you get going and and what the the life of your understanding of the theme is as as you move through I mean, this book was really like, this book was kind of a beast for me. Um, I knew I wanted to write on, you know, about like, I was kind of collecting, I had a folder in my computer called Freedom Knots, like with a K for a long time. And they were kind of aphorisms that I was writing about different paradoxes about freedom, um, where I would just kind of go around the world and hear whether it was like, you know, in civil rights discourse or in sexual freedom discourse, like, and I just hear comments in which the word freedom or liberation or emancipation or was used. And I would just, I was just kind of musing on them, you know, <laughs> and, and just kind of, they were not because they seemed to me slogans that made something sound simple and of course my mind always goes, but what about, but what about X or what about Z or like, you know, if we all are only going to be free when everyone's free, like, what do we do about parasites? Like, <laughs> like, like literally like in ecology, like, what do we do about like, um, you know, we, we want to like, I, I don't know. So I, so I, I kind of just, uh, I kept that file for a long time and then you know, yeah, the act of writing is very, I mean, the reason why this book was a beast was because like in each of these arenas, I had a lot that was bothering me, but I didn't really know what I thought about them. And you, and then you can have thoughts, but nothing, I don't know how to say it, but like thinking and then writing a sentence are like, you know, things collide. I mean, we all know this, you know, this as a writer too, like, you know, I guess if you think you're like, oh, I have this to say, and then you're halfway in the sentence and you're like, What's the verb? What am I saying? What's the predicate? What do I even think? You know, and so, um, so when I started writing, I, 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 I just, you know, I was, I was literally just thinking. I was just thinking and writing and thinking and writing, and it took, and it took a while, um, to, you know, the way I think is frustrating to me and to others because I do a lot of like uh, self interruptions and I do a lot of. Um, introducing a like I really love that whole Wittgenstein idea of like you're climbing up a ladder and you keep throwing off a rung as you've climbed it but sometimes I throw off so many that like people are like what's the point now we're just dangling in midair and like so so that can all so that takes a really long time uh to then read back what I've written and to you know ask myself what am I saying here like I'm dangling in the air. What do I, what do I want to get at? And then like you say with these, or what I said with like sleeper themes, you know, um, you know, any, any, I mean, writing a novel or a poem, like any, you know, anything you write, you're, it's kind of like dream work where you kind of go back and you see what your unconscious was injecting, like whether it's a symbol structure or whatever, but you know, critical writing is no different. Like you think, you know what you're writing, but uh, there are, there are, there are closet themes that, that, that you only see sometimes when they become dragged across many different subjects. And then you have to, you know, like in this book, a lot of that had to do with time and temporal, um, the way, 
just the way that the past, present, and future interact with our notions of freedom and with grief. And so I had to kind of pull that out. Like I had to pull out um, the commonalities that I found in each chapter and then kind of give uh, write into them a little bit so that the book hopefully, they're very distinct chapters, but that hopefully they have a little resonance with each other. Oh, so, you know. I, I, I like that you brought up the knots because I was going to bring that up. It's something that, you know, for those of you that when you read, they're like the knots keep coming up. And I kept thinking of like knots, like tension in my back that needed like to be massaged out. And I think you do such a great job sort of pulling pulling the knots out. Or maybe it's just like using that word I, I, I found really helpful um, as a through line uh, to reveal that tension that you're getting at. I mean, um, you know, this Artie Lang book, Knots, so you probably know it, but Artie Lang, you know, kind of anti-psychiatrist, you know, famous guy. I'm like, like, right. I, I write down tons of things, but like, it's Artie Lang like this, but I drew, I drew one of his knots, which is just yeah. like, <laughs> right. yeah, that's not. but you know, he'll be like, he was drawing knots of um, his patients and things that they would say, like, that's not an interesting finger. Take it away. It isn't an interesting finger. Let me suck it. Like these kind of, you know, really like weird knots um, that people would get. And he spatialized them all like showing what the particular structure, you know, like sometimes it would be like the knot I just showed you. Sometimes it would be kind of like a vertical, I can't get my paper and you're like, that's like a, like a square, but like a, whatever. But he, the book is like, it's a book. It, it looks like graphic poetry of these psychological um, afflictions. And when I read knots, um, I just, it, it really, really, it was, it was a number of years ago and several books back, but it never left me as like a, to recognize how helpful that sketching a problem was, um, it, you know, and, and then there's the problem of figuring out how to intervene in the cycle so that you might um, not keep repeating it. But the first step would be to sketch the problem. You know? Okay, so, but, so speaking of not in your research process or your creative process, and I know, of course, writing is also a process of editing out. Were there other songs? <laughs> there was one song on like uh, digital surveillance. And um, I mean, a lot of this book is interested in and kind of rejecting of the notion of false consciousness. Like when people say, like, oh, you think you're free, but you're not, you're just a tool, you know? And that's obviously, um, a very common kind of reframe with the internet, you know, like, oh, you think you're free when you're like choosing your dumbass emojis or whatever, but really you're just uploading your information yeah. to, you know, these evil tech giants who, you know, eventually want to, I don't know, put you in a, a camp or something. You know, like there's this kind of, so I, I was interested in, as with the drug chapter or other things, I was interested in like, you know, like with anything that has like maybe an addictive structure, like, we don't just do it because we're dumb. We do it because we're getting something out of it, you know? So I was kind of curious about writing about that. And then, but everything started to change so much with, um, with all that, like the discourse around it. I mean, you know, everyone knows, I need to tell anybody on this call how it's, how it all changed, but I didn't feel like I could really keep up with it. And there were more people like Zainab Tafiki and Car Swisher and all kinds of people doing really excellent work on that. And I just didn't feel like I needed to spend probably two years of my life, <laughs> like the way with like the climate chapter, I probably spent like six months to a year of my life reading climate material that I'd never read. I was like, oh my God, that digital chapter is going to take me another year or two. And I, I wasn't up for it, you know? And you do do such a great job in that. There's a wonderful afterword where you kind of reflect on the problem of like writing about the sort of urgency of now and what gets left out of that. And you're like, even the like last week of what's happening with, you know, legislation about reproductive rights, like yeah. the kind of points you bring up, they just continue to evolve and have, have so much of a, a life out of your, your book. But yeah. I'm sure it's both invigorating and frustrating <laughs> well, it's just stupid. Like, I mean, I was like, you know, I don't know if who, no one will ever remember this. Nobody, because it was like at the beginning of the Trump presidency when we like thought maybe there was going to be like 
a presidency or something <laughs> like so remember jeff sessions he put uh, like and chris christie he put in charge of like the opioid epidemic and this is why i say no one remembers because what happened there no you know nothing but like you know i had i wrote like i don't know i wrote like 25 pages on the chris christie opioid situation <laughs> Like for what? Like not, not, it was just like it was so. I mean, so there were so many things like that that I was like, uh, that, you know, and then that's fine because I like I learned from them, and one of the things I learned from that was that, you know, nothing was going to happen with with that, you know. And but anyway, I it was, um, you know, this book more than others was hard fighting things happening in the now because so much was going on on these topics. Um, but that said. Um, you know, I mean, this is a cliche, but like, obviously, if you're on to writing about anything, especially the issues about freedom and freedom and care that are, you know, centuries old, especially in this country, um, the eruption, say, of a freedom versus care discourse around the pandemic, which came about largely after I'd already finished writing this book, um, I'd already written all about that dichotomy in the book because yeah. it was pretty in place. And then now this individual freedom versus like care for others and the collective just got like technicolor reamplified and pumped out, but it was not as like, it's not new, you know, yeah. it's more depressing to see things that are like, you've already been writing about for years and you're like, Oh God, here it comes. Like I can script this. I can script this, what the right and left are going to be, what their slogans are going to be like, please just spare me. But, you know, there's a certain satisfaction in knowing that you've understood it, you know. Well, I mean, it's just also reading this. So let's let's take us back. We started, you know, we, we're we happy to have you because we have this show up right now on the work of Nikki Desenfall and part of the work on View, for those of you who've been able to see the show, is that she's she makes in the early 1960s these really strong, powerful representations of the female body that have, have certainly been understood with with under this kind of idea of freedom, right? But one coming out of a particular historical context, right? She's kind of like this proto-feminist artist. This is like, you know, early feminist art. Um, and um, how it's been understood, Maggie, and I, you, you probably know this too, is like under this discourse around the sort of the sort of radicalism of joy, right? Mm -hmm. That she's kind of creating these these figures that are kind of doing whatever they want, you know, in sort of in the face of um, you know the patriarchy and these sort of restrictions in the the nineteen sixties. And I just want to say too, like reading your book about the present and then sort of thinking back sixty years at this particular historical moment that I'm enmeshed in, you you repeat the line, and I'm sorry because I've forgot if uh, the theorist, but you, you say that the freedom is the defiant insistence of acting as if no one, as if one is already free. And put it in your chat because you're going to put it in my chat. Look, like, I got it wrong. Oh, this because everybody God. needs to know. Okay, here we go. All right. David Graeber, yeah. <laughs> Where is it? Look, I've done it wrong. Now I don't see it, Maggie. Well, that was in the private chat. Sorry, I thought maybe I could talk to you all. I, I teach, you know, so I'm very used oh, to okay. function with, with, with everybody, but I can't apparently contact you all. And I'm sorry for it. Anyway, David, David Graeber. David Graeber. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's brilliant. You, you reference it multiple times throughout the book. You know, again, the defined insistence of acting as if one is already free as such a kind of like, kind of connective tissue to, to this mm -hmm. book. And I kept thinking about that in relationship to Nikki de Sunfall's work, like yeah. joy as defiant mm -hmm. um, and about freedom uh, itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that Gloria Steinem quote that you guys had, that so I can't remember who used, maybe you even, maybe somebody, maybe Amelia Jones, I know, but used as the epigraph for the essay mm -hmm. saying, like, I saw her walking down the street and I was like, that's what a free woman looks like. And I think that that, quote, the Graeber quote, which is from um, Possibilities, um, uh, he was a po he was he, he was talking about, you know, um, the kind of politics that you enact that that, you know, something that we more would associate now with something like Occupy or something where you're where you're enacting what you want to see rather than kind of waiting um, waiting for it with a kind of ends justify the means kind of a thing. So I think, but that, but his idea, which I, and I pick up on this and, but the acting as if one's already free, and this is what relates to the Steinem quote is that like, 
there's a contagion, you know, when you, everyone has had experiences like this where you see someone doing something or acting in a way that you didn't know was in the, the Graeber title possibilities. You didn't know was possible mm -hmm. and you know, portals open through that. So I think that that always operates as a, in a lot of tension with this idea of false consciousness of like, oh, they thought they were free, but they weren't. But yet the acting as if um, makes freedom a certain kind of emancipation, like a, a contagion that kind of defies the boundaries of, um, of of the kind of system that a false consciousness system would set up. But that's why David Graeber and the Marxists were always, you know, the anarchists and the Marxists were always at odds because it's not the same, it's not the same analysis, you know. Right, but it just like it makes you see, and uh, you know what? So it's Gloria Steinem. She's recalling seeing Nikki de Saint Paul in the early 1960s, and Saint Paul is like walking down the street. She's like in a kind of man's uh, kind of rain slicker. She's wearing cow cowboy boots, and Gloria Steinem no says, and she was not wearing a purse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she was the first free woman I had ever seen, and it's such a wonderful way to to kind of think about St. Paul's work, think about these kind of representations of the female body under that, but also how, again, this kind of defiance becomes, becomes a lens to see something you hadn't noticed before, even for someone like Gloria Steinem at that time. And what do you think about like, so as you're immersed in this moment from like 60 years ago, like how do you relate it to the now, I guess? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's always a great question about audience, right? That how you're kind of anticipating an audience to read or understand the work and the relevance of art now. Like, why is her work important now? What is it doing? How are audiences responding to it? But again, this like sort of act of joy, this act of sort of this, these like curvy bodies in space, taking up space in a moment in Texas, in particular where a conversation is happening around reproductive rights and the sort of agency of the female body. I'd like to think that St. Paul's sort of success as an artist is sort of probing these questions and continuing to do so. And, and I hope that that is, is the case for but who, I don't you know, understand it's why. It's funny because when I was reading through the book, you guys have this great book and like, I'm, I'm, I'm on yeah. opposites on my Zoom screen, yeah. but like, you know, I was thinking a lot about Sarah Lucas um, and I was thinking about when Sarah Lucas had her first, uh, you know, retrospective at the New Museum a few years ago, there were all these articles like, you know, but is Sarah Lucas really who we need now in like the Me Too moment or something? And I. And I thought a lot about that with reading this too, because there were similarities between Lucas and the fall. And I, and I, again, back to this notion of like, um, uh, of, of art, just like it is like, like that these things when they were, you know, it really bothered me. Like, what do you mean the artist we need now? Like they were, you know what I mean? It's like, what can we, what can we get from what they were? Not like, are they, you know, it is the meme of them of, that we just that we want to circulate on a subway or something the thing that we think will be politically advantageous to the moment like that just I don't know, it seems to me a, a, not the question I would ask you know although I mean it's also a question like why why now why would a museum show you know right. decision yeah. that's been of made about right. courses and presentations and I mean it's certainly something like I think about a lot it's like why we did this show now I mean we were kind of coming out of the Me Too movement, looking at, you know, artists that, you know, were engaged in a particular conversation and mm -hmm. just provides another way to see historical work and to look back, right, at that mm -hmm. moment in, in feminist art history. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's been fun. I mean, it, it's bringing up a lot of salient questions, I think, mm -hmm. and I hope. Um, so wait, Maggie, we're we're gonna run out of time, and I need to okay. have some audience questions. questions. I know. Um, okay. Um, should I look at them through? Should I look through? Well, them? that's gonna be hard. These are like really amazing questions, everyone. Okay, let's. I'm just gonna read one. Let's go for it, Maggie. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, I'm lightly gonna be coughing here, but I think that Nikki Kasumi Clements, our friend at Rice University. Um, 
I think, a, do, can you see it, Maggie, too? See it. Yeah, I'll read along with you. I'll read it out loud. I think a lot about care of the self as a construct from Michel Foucault that has theoretical limitations and possibilities at the intersection of political and ethical projects that do not degrade into neoliberal sophilicisms. As you read from your first piece, you seem to suggest forms of aesthetics that are not about dispersion of power, not as antithetical to political projects, but as creating the conditions for acts of resistance and political critique. In this register, I wonder what you might think of Audre Lorde's affirmation in A Burst of Light that quote, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. To bring it to St. Paul, I love the resonance between your work and Michelle's text on St. Paul's work as formation through resistance to the gravity of domination and normative logics. Oh, Nikki, good question. <laughs> um, well, maybe this is cheating. But so I stopped reading. I said, like, attending to these freedoms, you know, has become, you know, and attending these other issues has become our charge. But the next paragraph that I didn't read says the current interest in care has multiple roots and vectors, including the crises of care brought by racial capitalism and neoliberalism, feminist debates over ethics of care versus ethics of justice, Foucault's writing on the care of the self, which grew out of his earlier focus on practices of freedom, and an intensified focus on self-care and healing as critical components of activism and high profile battles over healthcare. Um, at any rate, I go on and, and and kind of go through a bunch of others, but I just wanted to note that only in that we were about to get to that in the next, in the very next paragraph that both the Foucault and the um, Audre Lorde, because that highlighting of self-care and the quote that um, you've put there is the one that's most often um, brought to the fore um, as the kind of, um, you know, uh, critical um, slogan about how to understand self-care. So I think, um, I don't know quite, let's see like what the question is, um, but yeah, I don't know, I'm trying, I'm looking to see like. Um, I don't know, I can't really, I can't quite, it's not, it's not, it's not the, fault of this, it's the fault of our temporal construct here where I don't think I have the time to, yeah. nor do I have yeah. the person in front of me to get to talk to, to pull out what I, what would be most like at issue, like what you, what you'd want to hear about exactly in here. So I don't, I don't want to go off on a bad tangent, but I would say that um, I do sense in the question, like, and I, uh, About the art part, I guess I would just say that I think that there is, um, I think that the chapter is like challenging insofar as I think that like a lot of claims, um, and I talk about this mostly through Jose Munoz, like a lot of claims about like how art, as he puts it, could be like the blueprint, um, you know, of, make, of, of, of social change. Um, uh, or as he says, a utopian blueprint for a possible future. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I don't disagree that like art can do that. <laughs> um, and I think, and it has done that even for me, but the chapters, I think it's challenge is to also um, let up on the demand that art do that or that like our critical practice of saying like it's only worthy if it does that, which is kind of a way of getting us out of what Sedgwick called, you know, the kind of subversive kind of hegemonic like reading that we've all been kind of trained to do that at this point, even if you weren't trained to do it, we kind of all do it anyway. Like, mm -hmm. oh, the new sex in the city, like it's kind of subversive because they're old, but it's totally politi politically reactionary because they're fucked up and stupid. Like, it's like that's kind of like what we do <laughs> like, as a matter of course. And I'm just I'm interested in like, um, if we kind of step away, like what other waters can we swim in, you know, as viewers mm -hmm. and critics, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, let's do one more question, okay. Maggie. Um, Krista Forster, um, does your work on freedom pick up, play, or extend John Keats's idea of negative capability? When a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching 
after fact and reason. Yeah, I mean, I love Keats, I love negative capability, I love all that. I mean, I think what Keats is talking about, um, I mean, he's talking about a lot of things, but I think that in the kind of more poetic um, arena that he's talking about is a little different than I think the kind of uncertainty that like a, a scholarly discursive book like this is that like I don't I do reach after fact and reason you know like in this book so it's not really about um, exactly that but I will say that something that I do try and do um, and that I think is complicated to try and do but it, it, but and, and that I you know, work a lot on with, with my students is that like, I, anytime you read something that, especially if you read something that's not what you think, or like, that's not what you think on the surface, like say for the drug chapter, I read a lot of things about like libertarian things about drugs, like, you know, radical texts on like legalization, like, or not even like, with not even any drug treatment or like letting people self-destruct. I read all kinds of things, you know, and and whenever you're reading things like there's this real tension where you're like part of you is going, no, no, I don't believe that. No, that's terrible. But beyond that, the bigger tension is going like, if I even read this, will I be corrupted and like changed? Will it like infect me that I read this person saying this thing that I, I that I'm scared of or that I, you know, and I, I do think a certain kind of negative capability, like of like coming to things and it's kind of reading, it's like reading, like, 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 like not, not getting ensconced in the drama of like, am I letting this infect me versus am I protecting myself from it? Or, or am I fully flooding myself with this? Like, like, but just, just kind of reading it like a suspension, you know, like insofar as that relates to negative capability, I, I think I did a lot of that with this book because even like with ecology, you know, with a lot of like deep ecological stuff, you know, and, you know, it can really edge into like a, you know, anti-human, like anti-civ space stuff yeah. where, you know, and that, that stuff is actually some of the hardest stuff for me to read because I'm really attached to culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I sometimes would like read these texts and be like, I don't even want to imagine the earth without us. I don't want to, I don't, you know, and, but I, but I would do it anyway, because I just, you know, I'd like, I, I deem certain things worth trying on, you know? So I think that mm -hmm. there's a form of negative capability in that. And I think you get better at it with age, by which I mean that like, I noticed that, you know, my, it's really like a, I mean, undergraduates can be kind of good at it, but then by the time you're a graduate student, there's often like a lot more anxiety because you're kind of trying harder to become yourself. And then I think once you kind of become some self, you know, at least for me, you know, I'm kind of hoping that middle age to the end will be like unbecoming <laughs> that self. Um, and I think that can let you read with a lighter touch, you know. And well, I just want to say this question, I know we are like running out of time. I'm not going to answer it per se, but I just want to say that this reversal about freedom and fun and the leftist system, I just think it's a really maybe you guys don't all have it, but I just think it's a really, th th this chapter about art kind of takes up this Wendy Brown analysis about what happens when the right wing really seizes on the freedom and fun discourse. And and, and not only the freedom and fun, but, but, but really more specifically disinhibition. And I, I'm a very lay psychoanalytical reader. Like I don't, I'm not super, I'm not like a psychoanalytically trained critic or anything, but I'm really interested in, you know, and Adam Phillips has said some really interesting things. I quote my chapter about kind of like the way he puts it is like in a psychoanalytical sense, like like that we we hate people who who ask us to inhibit ourselves. Like it's any kind of like infantile way, like to be inhibited is to like produce a hate response. And like I've, I've just thought about this a lot, like in terms of um, the kind of deplorable like letting it all hang out discourse and then versus this kind of like leftist like you know the kind of caricature of the word policing like i don't believe in the caricatures of it but i do think that there's something um about like fascism and disinhibition and like and the and the id and cruelty and we've seen this movie before um we've seen carnivals of violence and like disinhibition before even with like the patina of order like in the third reich um We've seen this pairing, you know, of, of, of the disinhibited carnival of cruelty mixed with, I, I just think it's really, I think it's really, um, 
I, I sadly think it's going to be uh, I, the reason why I'm pointing out this question is because I, I, I suspect this is going to be like a very big question for the next, you know, couple decades. And I and I don't have a solution for it. But I think Wendy Brown, and other people who've thought hard about it are thinking about the right thing. Can you tell us what you might what questions you might be thinking about next in your work? Oh, like in, <laughs> not about this, but not about solving the freedom and freedom. I, I don't yeah. Well, they're good questions. As, yeah. we wrap, as we wrap up, um, unfortunately, we're yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, the next thing I have to do is like, actually, it's kind of related to to the the venue. Is that I, I have a book of like art essays, which are written about particular artists, but are all um, just appear in scattered catalogs. So I'm I'm collecting those right now for a book that'll probably come out in 2023. But I want to add to it by writing some new essays, and and that'll be, I think. Um, you know, I, I really, really miss in COVID, like I haven't been taking in, you know, nearly as much other people's uh, living work as I'm used to. And, and I really feel it as a, as a strong lack. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I don't know, I mean, after this project, which was, like I said, kind of such a heavy lift for a while, I, I, I keep joking that all I want to do is write like Dada's poetry. Like I feel very <laughs> like, I feel like speaking of the negative capability, I feel strong yeah. to not grasp after reason or fact um, in any shape or form, but I don't think I probably will uh, cut up a newspaper, but I, but I, but I am interested in kind of, um, I don't know. I'm interested in, we've all been so steeped in the, the, the daily, I think, during lockdown and stuff. And I think I, I mean, this is kind of related to the freedom and the fun and disinhibition. Like, um, I was really not feeling much freedom, fun or disinhibition, you know, and, and, and I, and it, but it made me think a lot about, um, a, a new kind of thinking about the con the daily and constraint and the domestic arena. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what comes of it, but I'm just, I'm thinking still. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, and I hope you're enjoying talking about this book. I want to encourage everyone to go and get it. Um, it is available now at the Mineral Collection bookstore uh, for those of you in the audience in Houston. And thank you, Maggie. This was so much fun. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, thank you to Rich and the team at Imprint. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about our upcoming programs or Imprint's upcoming programs, please visit our website. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thanks, thank Maggie. You. Thank you so much. Thank pleasure. you. Yep. <laughs>